the title of today's message is The Glory of the Lord. <laughs> the Glory of the Lord. A commentary and exhortation on verses. This is not a composed sermon. This is merely a collection of verses that... Um, in looking up in the Bible, the word glory, going through it, just check and see what's there, why this word keeps coming at me, why the Lord keeps working this issue. And I believe that it is a crucial issue because there is a need for much more of His glory. We say the anointing, and the anointing is good. And the anointing gets us ministry and carries us up and lifts us up. But I, at the moment, am conjecturing that it is but a few drops of the glory. If we can handle the anointing, we'll be qualified to handle the glory. What I want to do with this message this morning, therefore, is just take the verses in the order that I pluck them out of the scriptures and let the Spirit of the Lord hit me on whichever way He wants to on these verses. May just be factual, may just be more than factual. The word glory is used about 402 times in the English Bible when I did my little scan. But admittedly, the word glory is used a couple of different ways throughout the Scriptures. A lot of times it is used in conjunction with giving somebody credit or somebody getting their, re their respect or getting their you know, credit that's due them for their accomplishments, you know, giving them their glory. I'm not dealing with that aspect of it. That would, could be a message all by itself. A good example of that would be First Chronicles 29.11, which says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. A declaration of, it's your victory, it's your majesty, you get the credit, I'm taking none of it. Yea and amen, period. And that is giving God his glory from us. The point of this message, however, is to look at verses and comment on verses that deal with what happens when God appears. The term that's used to describe is His glory. And there are certain concepts woven around each of these verses when that term glory shows up, and so I'm going to um, expound a little bit. I only have 13 pages worth of verses. So I'm sure that we can get through it in 13 minutes. <laughs> Unless, of course, the Lord decides to add, which he does. The other day we were doing, in our fellowship night, verses. And we read verses and we made faith comments on verses. And I was given, by coincidence, the Isaiah 61 and two, and three, huh? 61, and two, and three. And that is the verses I'd like to open up with again. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The glory of the Lord shall be seen upon thee. Keep that in mind as we're skipping our stone across the waters of these words, these verses. Realize that if this is being offered to us, what is being offered to us becomes the question. And the impact of just how big is that? 
Now, so, so it's, we're, we're uh, old enough in the Lord to know and have heard the usage of the term the glory of the Lord on and off. We, got ha we have some preconceived notions as to what it is and isn't. But I think that we need to become more aware, uh, more affected, more open, more perceptive, more touchy-feely with it, rather than nice concept from Scripture. When he says great darkness upon the earth, and then he says, but the glory of the Lord is upon you, what is the picture that brings up in your mind? I'm going to hope that these verses that we've got will help paint that picture a little bit by kind of a puzzle mosaic of, okay, what does this verse say? Okay, what does that verse say? What's a little impact here, and what's a little impact there? And try to, in your own minds, put the fabric together in the way that your spirit can see it for what these verses talk about. So we'll start at the beginning of the book, and we'll go to the end of the book. Okay? First, we'll begin by looking at some of the verses in Exodus, the glory mentioned in Exodus. Coming out of Egypt, rescued, revival, Success, no more slavery, exit is. We're out. The sign pointed that way, we left. As Moses and Israel have to deal with their new life, they also have to deal with their new leader, God. Before, they could do things by the councils of Goshen. They could do things under the commands of Pharaoh. They were not able to make decisions for their own life because they were slaves. And they did what they were told. And now they're free people. Praise God. All right. <laughs> no, they're led people who are free. <laughs> Praise God. And, of course, Israel being what it was, a young nation freshly plucked out of the center of an old nation, they had some growing up to do. They had some changing to do. Moses, their leader, had some leadership skills to gain. He had to learn how to manage some people. He had to know when to say yay and when to say nay. He had to know when to say stop and when to say go. He had to know when to say to one come, and he cometh, and to another go, and he goeth. And Moses, to his credit, did not try to do that by himself. <laughs> because God had plucked this nation out and said, Now, I'm going to write the rules. I'm going to give the supplies. I'm going to give the leading. I'm going to show you where you're going. And you're free people. The glory of the Lord in Exodus, when it shows up, is, well, it's more than dad. It is, you will listen now. This is something we get out of the book of Exodus. When the glory of the Lord shows up, it is time to be aware. For good or for evil, you will be aware. Let me give you the first verse out of Exodus I've got here. Exodus 16, 7. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord. Oh, praise God, praise God, I'm going to see the glory of the Lord. For he heareth that your murmurings against the Lord, and what you murmur against us. <laughs> so the first verse I come up with, Everybody wants to see the glory of the Lord. <laughs> The first verse we trip on, kerplunk, face in the sand, O Israel, is, and you know I've been listening in on your conversations. <laughs> what have you been talking about? You wanted me to saw a step in and manage this uh, 2.5 million people with you, Moses? Or 3.5, depending on what the estimates are. Uh, you would like to see more of me? Glad to show up. But I don't just show up for fun. If the glory of the Lord shows up, the first thing he says is, and he heareth your murmurings, you know. Moses, tell him, I'm listening. Poof, here I am now. <laughs> it 
you got to catch the humor in that. you got to catch the uh, <clears throat> terror in that. The glory of the Lord, when it shows up, will change something. It cannot be any other way because he isn't going to show up as it were for fun. Some people say, well, the Lord sometimes just likes to play with his children. And there is a half-truth in that. But it's a funny thing about God when he plays with his children. He usually sneaks something out of their pocket on the way out. He usually adjusts something while they're playing. He usually does something and, oh, that was a wonderful time in the Lord. And, wait a second. Why do I feel like I got corrected on something? Wait a second. What? All of a sudden, I'm not doing something anymore. All of a sudden, that sin's not there anymore. But we were just playing. I don't understand. Yeah, but see, when the glory of the Lord shows up, the glory of the Lord shows up with influence. And we have to understand that. that these verses have, like, little indicators hiding in them. Whereas if you read it in their storyline, it says, yeah, 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 and they talked, and they argued, and the glory of the Lord showed up, and they talked, and they argued, and then somebody died, and the glory of the Lord showed up, and they died. And we just gloss right on by that. You know, the glory of the Lord showed up. So now we're coming back and saying, you know, microscope down just on that verse and what's right near it. And the first thing that hits my heart is, whew, uh, if I'm going to ask for the glory of the Lord, I better be willing to accept a little correction en route. The glory of the Lord when it shows up in a church is likely to find out that there are people who have been murmuring and there's been people who have been believing, there's people who are remnant, there are people who are, who are not remnant, there are, you know, there's mixed multitude, there's a leader trying to cope with people who keep bucking him, and the glory of the Lord is going to show up. Do we need the glory of the Lord show up for that circumstance? Absolutely. Positively. Did they need it in their time period? Absolutely. Positively. So, let's start our whole understanding of the wonderful glory of God, the wonderful glory of the Lord, by saying the reality check. <laughs> reality check. It is a good thing when the anointing comes upon you for strength. It is a good thing when the anointing comes upon you for ministry. But don't be surprised if it also comes upon you for correction, edification, and comfort. Instruction in righteousness. A little bit of a just of the bones. A little bit of a... <coughs> or, you know, the anointing that drops and goes, Ooh, that was a prick. Ooh, that stuck me. Don't be surprised. You're just fresh out of Egypt. What do you expect? That you're perfect and he's not going to fix something? Okay, moving on. Exodus 16.10 And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the ch children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Seems like a pretty straightforward verse. But consider, Aaron the priest, speaking in front of the congregation of Israel, and they look across the wilderness, and there the Lord shows up. Poof. <laughs> Pardon the pun, but poof. Behold. Now, you got to picture this for a second. Put yourself in the scene just a little bit. You're standing next to Ben so-and-so, your friend, Ben so-and-so, your brother, Ben so-and-so, so-and-so, and up in front of you is Ben Aaron. You know, Aaron, Ben, son of, you get my point? And you're all looking at Aaron going, so what's going on here? What's happening, dude? What's going to take place? And as you're looking at Aaron, all of a sudden you're looking across the wilderness. And it says, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Now that means it was huge. It was tall, large, <laughs> massive. This was not no... Uh, not no. How about that for English? This was not a little magician's trick of a poof of a fire sticking out in the middle of space floating through the air. This was, you're looking across the horizon of a wilderness, you know, sunny horizon of a wilderness, dead, dry, barren place. And at a distance, here comes, whomp. I mean, talk about heavenly halogen. Talk about, I don't know what that was, but it's big. Talk about, I feel dwarfed. And the next thought in your mind becomes, what if it moves towards me? Now, Israel 
If you think, uh, you, you keep, keep your own knowledge of Scripture running in the back of your brain as I'm talking. Israel has had to deal with this several times. They're going to deal with it through Exodus. We're going to go through Leviticus, Deuteronomy. No, we're, I mean, this was not an once-in-a-lifetime experience in God. This was a... <coughs> excuse me. This was a... Whoops, there it is. Whoops, there it is again. Whoops, there it is. Whoops, there it is again. I'm being tongue-in-cheek on purpose. Because the only alternative is, oh my God, there it is again. Which is probably closer to the truth. Exodus 24, 16. The glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Okay, it shows up, and nothing happens for six days. I don't know why the anointing's here. I don't get it. I just feel this gift of prophecy. There's nothing to do. I don't know why I'm getting these revelations. There's nobody to teach it to. You have to see again all of Israel standing there going, it's still there. <laughs> You have to see in your own heart yourself standing there going, what's going to happen now? You have to remember, when it shows up, sometimes it shows up with something good. Laws, instructions and in righteousness, comfort, direction, leading. And sometimes it shows up and all of a sudden Moses takes his staff out and he does something and people are toast or in trouble. Or This isn't just, oh cool. This is people going, what now? <laughs> This is six days of people going, what now? <laughs> Moses sitting there. Yep, he's there. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Man of God has to wait too, you know. He doesn't necessarily get insight as to why it's there. He just knows all of a sudden it's there. Because when God decides to show up, he'll do it in his own time, in his own way. And we are the servants who are waiting for the instruction. Get used to it. <laughs> Point number two in this, it shows up upon Mount Sinai. Where are they? Down in the wilderness. Oh, my God, he showed up again. Guess I, uh, Martha, get me my coat, get me my staff, get me a bottle of water. It's going to be a long walk. <laughs> I had to go back to the mount again. Conference time. I've been summoned. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's the way it is. You want to see the glory of the Lord? Then you might as well start prepping your heart now for the response time. You might as well start preparing yourself for all that mixed multitude that are going to go... Bah, 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 bah. Talk, talk, talk. You might as well prepare your house in order... Because you don't know if you're coming back from that mountain. This is true. You don't know. No. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him, and then he was not. You know what I mean? All he knows is God showed up, wanted to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting a point across here? The here and the now is all you have when the glory of the Lord shows up. Because you cannot predict what your next two minutes are. Are you going to laugh? Or are you going to cry? Are you going to get slain in the spirit? Are you going to fall? Are you going to spin like a top? Are you going to float? <laughs> <laughs> All the books I read, I've seen examples of every kind there. Are you going to just check out? Like some people when they get, get uh, slain in the spirit and... and all of a sudden, you know, the testimony says they were on the ground for six hours. Everybody else left. The building closed. The congregation walked out, and the poor soul was still laying there on the ground. <laughs> and he wakes up, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, he didn't wake up. He was quite busy. <laughs> but from everybody else's appearance, hey, John fell asleep. No, he didn't. Well, we can't wake him. Well, you better leave him alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there a pulse? He's not dead. Can we wake him up? No. Imagine for a moment being slain in the spirit at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, and because of all the rules of safety that are wrapped around our universe, 
they have to cart you off to the emergency ward because they can't figure out why you're catatonic. <laughs> they don't know you're having a conversation. And then you wake up on a gurney <laughs> with a grin on your face. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is don't try to figure it out what it's going to be when you come back. Don't try to look in your heart and say, oh, when the glory of the Lord comes, here's what's going to happen. I promise you, there are certain things that will happen as the glory of the Lord shows up. And there are certain things you will not be able to predict when the glory of the Lord shows up. And when he does show up, if he shows up five miles away, guess what happens? Everybody who's sensitive to the glory of God all of a sudden starts going like a bunch of birds in the air heading for the local feeder. What's going on over there? See, when man throws a party, <laughs> man kind of has a choice whether he gets to come or not. When God throws a party, you get a choice. But it's much tougher. You've got to resist the pull of the magnet if God throws a party. The glory of the Lord covers the mountain. What mountain? That's what I said. The glory of the Lord covered the mountain. What mountain? Have you ever seen a fog when it rolls in? Like a fog out here? And it just consumes Kent Valley, and it consumes the backdrop, and it consumes the hillsides, and I can stand out on my porch, and, you know, I can see a few street lights off, and after that, I have no idea where Burien went. How do I even know it's still there? Maybe while the fog was there, it got bombed. And when the fog leaves, I'll discover the Burien disappeared. I don't know. Likewise, when the glory of the Lord shows up on a mountain, shows up on a person, shows up in a room, shows up on a church, who knows what people outside are going to see or not see. Will they see lightnings coming off the mountaintop? That's what they saw. Will they see fire? Will they see smoke? Will they see glow? Will they see sparkle? Will they see... Who knows? Who knows? The glory of the Lord, we have yet to see and experience the full magnitude of the manifestation of his glory, which is what this is talking about. But we've also found ourselves short of what's in that manifestation, in that glory. Because Moses never goes up to the mountain to hang out in the glory and come back empty-handed or empty-faced. <laughs> we'll get to that one. That's in here, I'm pretty sure. Exodus twenty four seventeen twenty four seventeen, The sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Okay, we now have a volcano. <laughs> Looks like a volcano, acts like a volcano, but it ain't a volcano. Or was it? Do we know what that mountain was or wasn't doing? Do you know that in another passage it says the earth shook? In another passage it says that they dared to not even go near it. They were afraid to just get near it. They were terrified. Mm -hmm. God says things like, you know, yet one more time, I will not only shake this, I will shake that. He's obviously shook a few things in the past. Or he wouldn't be able to make it as a comparative that he's going to shake a few things in the future. And he's saying it to people who should understand what he means when he says, I shook a few things in the past. <laughs> this mountain, cloud, fire, smoke, lightning, and a humble servant going for a quest. <laughs> well, more precisely, at request. To go up into that, to stand in front of that, to be the little guy <laughs> on the big mountain consumed by the bigger God. <coughs> we are so used to thinking in our terms as to what the glory of the Lord should look like. In religion, in religion schools, in psychology schools who study phenomena, in phenomena schools who study psychology, <laughs> all trying to figure out well, I don't know if that's the right way it should be. And is that the way it should look? And is that really proper? And can God do that? And is that really? What would you do if all of a sudden Mount Rainier disappeared in a pile of fire and 
brimstone and it's not consumed and there's no lava. And and all the men of God go, uh-oh, duck! <laughs> you know, I can just see the camera crew now. This is Channel 4, circling around what used to be Mount Rainier. We're not quite sure where it is at the moment, but it seems to be consumed by an eternal fog. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it's going to be, the end of the world has come. <laughs> I think it's going to be, oh no, the planet is falling apart. Huh? It's not blowing up. I don't get it. Does it make sense? Oh. I think it's going to boggle. I think the end times are going to boggle. It's going to throw us completely out of kilter when the book of Revelation even begins to start having its parts fulfilled. Because when the glory of the Lord shows up, he comes with action. When the glory of the Lord shows up, here's what he shows up to do. Exodus 29:43. And there I will meet with the children of Israel. Yay, I wanted to meet with God. And the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. You know what happens when all of a sudden the glory shows up on something? Woe unto anything what touches it. Mm -hmm. Don't touch my anointed. Don't do my prophets any harm. Mm -hmm. I'm on them. Don't take that vessel that you donated to my temple. Bring it in. Sanctify it under my holy glory. And then turn around and think you're going to take it back out of my holy glory and drink water out of your cistern with it. Ooh. This is yes. a hint. <laughs> this yes. is a hint. The hint is plain. Sanctified by my glory. The whole sanctification movement in the early 1900s, late 18, early 1900s, they wanted to be set apart. And they were. And God showed up and started bringing tongues and the gifts of the Spirit back. You don't think it wasn't based on their prayers, having been in the sanctification for a little bit? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, we want to see more of you. We want to see you just make us sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. Make us all sanctified. Get the brethren. Go get everybody. And God says, done. And then about 20 years later, whomp. But people don't see, because they don't look at history, the corollary between the saints who prayed back here and the arrival of Pentecost 20 years later, roughly. And we don't see all the prayers we're putting up right now. Oh, Lord, come down and purify the earth and get rid of this darkness and shine your bright light in. While we're waiting, and in about 20 years, I'm being a little facetious, it might be two all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord starts showing up in places. You see, you have to understand that he doesn't have short memory. <laughs> and what you pray today went on an eternal register. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be granted tomorrow at 5 p.m. or the year 2055 at 5 p.m. is none of your business. It's the glory's business. When you step up before the Lord and say, I accept the responsibility, let thy glory come down upon me, mm -hmm. that I might be the intercessor like Moses was. Let your glory come down upon me, that I might be the vehicle like... Now you have a n unique relationship with the future. Mm -hmm. When Moses came down from that glory, <clears throat> Israel's life changed. You have to see that. Moses Moses knew more and more and more, but Israel had to change more and more and more. If we will summon in what God is asking us to summon in, we are going to be so absolutely surprised. But we will be sanctified. That is to say, we will become purer and purer and purer and purer and all the dross must go away because it cannot abide the heat. Exodus 33:18. Knowing this, therefore, here is our prayer. And he said, <coughs> I beseech thee, show me thy glory. A man of God who's already got a relationship with God turns around and says, show me thy glory. Just how much more do you want? What, it's not enough? 
I come to you in visions, I come to you in dreams, I come to you in miracles, and you want more? Yes. Be zealous of spirituals. I speak in tongues. Great. Go get prophecy. I have prophecy. Great. Go get miracles. I have miracles. Great. <laughs> get the next one that God's willing to give you. Because you have not begun to tap the glory of God. How many deposits of oil are there in the world? Yeah. Dozen or two, three. How much is it running the world right now? When somebody one day finally got smart enough to tap low enough and far enough into this strange thing called Earth and bubble up, you know, black crude, black crude yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden the world changed, didn't it? Well, what's going to happen when we dig our own well and accidentally tap the glory of God? Didn't he say, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? How about I rewrite that for you? Uh-huh. I will put my glory upon thee, and out of thy belly shall flow light. Be. Light was. Show me thy glory. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? When was the last time I prayed that prayer? Show me your glory. No, usually it's help. <laughs> help me, help them, help us, help the world, help the universe, help. How about just, I'm ready to bask. Basking now. Basking mechanism is on. Basking mechanism is wide open. Waiting. You know, I mean, if you want to bake something. I know I always get rats for talking about baking a cake. But if you want to bake something, you go up to the oven and you preheat it. You get it up to 400 degrees and then you put in the cake. <laughs> okay? Well, actually, the thing that becomes the cake is if you put in the cake, you're doing it backwards. But anyway. <laughs> so when you stand before God, why not just open up the oven, turn on the valve and preheat and wait and wait you say, well, I don't like waiting. Tough. Wait. What you don't realize is God is also standing up there going, see that devil? He's waiting. See that, angels? She's waiting. See that world? Oh, just wait. <laughs> the glory of the Lord will consume, will envelop. Is the glory of the Lord just a nice concept to mean, figuratively speaking, that God just happened to communicate today? I think not. I think it came to shake, awake, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. To change. No, son, you're going the wrong way. This way. No, church, you're going the wrong way. That way. This is the glory of the Lord. So for us to request it and say, show me thy glory, God goes, just like this. Exodus 30, 22. Same, same chapter. And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by... You can't handle it yet. <laughs> but that was back in Exodus. Times are changing. Times are changing. People are using this verse as an excuse. It is true, we still can't handle the entire frontal face of the glory of God. But the hinder parts are getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Look at church history. You know, when a king walks into a room... And he's got his train, you know, his, his robe on, and he's carrying his scepter, and you know, all that for royalty stuff. And he comes around the corner. There's a train that follows behind him. Now, when a king walks in the room, it's not polite to look him in the eye. You know that, right? It's not polite to look him in the eye. Any foreign world, when a king walks in the world, you do this. And your eyes go to the ground, you bow down. When he passes by you, then you're permitted to look up as he arrives up to his throne. So should it be for all the saints. But the glory that's following all that is for us to see. If the king is going to look you in the face, he's going to do something with you. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but speaking out of my own flesh, when my boss's boss's boss is walking through the building... I try not to look him in the eye unless I want a job assignment. <laughs> I'm being a little humorous. 
you never know when you're near a dignitary what they're going to pop up with in their mind and say, oh, that's right, you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But in the old days, the king was to be respected, bowed down in front of. When the glory showed up, they trembled. When the glory showed up, they bowed. When the glory showed up, Aaron said, shut up, he's going to talk. When the glory showed up, Moses is walking back from the mountain and everybody's like, uh-oh. There is no brash American attitude of, well, bless God, I know who I am in God. Yeah, the last time Miriam and Aaron tried that routine. Well, we're prophets too. Uh-huh. Yeah, you are. Uh, but let me give you a demonstration of who's head prophet. Because the glory on me is greater than the glory on you. And there is such a thing as degrees of, of, of brilliance in the sky, among the saints, in the heavens. It is a type. The stars out there are a type. We don't all shine in the same brightness or come from the same source of heat of the Lord. We have magnitudes and differences. Oh, I better move on or I'll never get through this message. Okay. Exodus 40.34 then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now think about this for a moment. Originally, when God first started showing up and talking to Moses, he shows up on a mountain. And then he starts getting a little closer, doesn't he? Now he's showing up on a tabernacle, a tent. Now Moses doesn't have to walk as far. <laughs> he's got a little bit closer relationship with the Lord, as it were. And Israel is also a little bit closer. We have to consider that at different times in history, the presence of the Lord is further or closer, stronger or, or more localized. So now we have the tent. And I don't remember where this tent was, but it was outside boundaries of Israel somewhere. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was in the center of Israel, outside of Israel, on the edge. My mind says it was in the center, but either way, now you've got Moses, and where Moses is, the glory is. Whereas before, where glory is, the Moses is. When the glory starts getting to the place where it's so localized that it's standing in the middle of your congregation, instead of summoning you across town to the other place, the corrections, the instructions, the directions come quicker, faster, and you've got to respond sooner. There's no time to say... Oh, that's Moses coming back. Well, he'll be here in about a day. <laughs> it's Moses went into the tabernacle. Pack up, Martha. We have no idea what's hitting next. Because now it's closer. It's more local. It's more central. When God first starts to deal with Christians, he oftentimes stands at a distance, snatches them up to heaven, puts them in places distant. And then after a while, your Christianity starts getting really personal. You wake up in the morning and the Lord's in your right ear. <laughs> Hi, good morning. <laughs> not going to take me in a vision and a dream to talk to me? No, not today, just going to talk to you. Uh-oh, coming closer to the tabernacle, eh? Coming closer to the old tabernacle, eh? Speaking from within you now, is he? Oh, dear, used to speak from without you. Matter of fact, the only time you ever heard the voice of God was when he came out of that preacher over there. And all of a sudden it's coming out of you? Doesn't that feel like the cloud moved just a little closer? Yeah, it went from the mountain and the man to the tabernacle. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. <coughs> Exodus 40:35. This one's interesting. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now this time it's, oh no, it's so strong he can't get in. <laughs> like I said, what did you expect to understand what's going to happen every time? My point here out of Exodus so far is, at the very beginning of Israel when they knew nothing about nothing about nothing, God is already teaching by example. One minute this way, another minute that way, another minute this minute. Now imagine for a moment the people going, well, that doesn't make any sense. The glory cloud shouldn't be showing up on the tabernacle. It always used to show up on the mountain. You can't possibly do that. I mean, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where God ever did it that way. It was always up on the mountain. 
See, all the examples we know of up to this minute in time is only God only does it one way. Uh, but the problem is these examples that are written for us are to show us that he changes his mind quite often. <laughs> he didn't say, I wrote these things down for you so I, that you know that I only do it this way. He wrote these things down for us so he knows, we know that he can do it any way he likes. Oh, well, that makes me feel insecure. That means I have no way of judging whether or not that manifestation really was of God or not. It means I've got to try the spirits. <laughs> and your point is, you think the glory of the Lord can't be bright enough, strong enough, visible enough, that you should know it enough? Are you telling me you're a sheep and can't hear his voice? Nah. God will make his way absolutely clear. The glory mentioned in Leviticus. Leviticus 9.6. Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. He didn't say it's just going to appear unto me. It's going to appear unto you. Here's what the Lord told you to do, and you're obviously having a little trouble with this, so the glory of the Lord is going to show up to you at his P.S. for your benefit. Having trouble with obedience? Call on the glory of the Lord and see what happens. Having a problem with surrender? Call upon the glory of the Lord and see what happens. Having a problem with your will, are you? Fine, I'll pray that the glory of the Lord show up on you. How about that? Moses, taking care of his pastorly responsibility. Lord, they're murmuring again. Show up. <laughs> okay, go tell them I'm going to show up. Hey guys, he's going to show up. Boom, oh, he showed up. We have a very good relationship, leaders and sheep. More and more men of God, more and more leaders of God, more and more women of God, more and more intercessors of God are going to learn just how important their relationship is to the glory. <coughs> Leviticus 9.23 Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Now, <coughs> you, you disciples, when you go into that person's house, I want you to put your blessing upon it. What blessing do they have to give? The blessing of the Lord. Do we have any idea what showed up on some of those houses when they showed up? Healing, deliverance, presence? We weren't there. All it says is they blessed the house, the recipient didn't like the blessing. They left. There are people who run away from the presence of the Lord when it shows up. That's true. Very much so. Let's go to Numbers. Numbers 14.10. This is in the middle of a context, so don't be surprised by the beginning of it. But all the congregation bathed stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle and the congregation before all the children of Israel. Correction had to be done. When the correction was done, the glory of the Lord showed up. So when does the glory of the Lord show up? Well, it shows up before to correct you, and it will show up after when you've done what you're supposed to do, after a correction has been taken, take, taken place. Because as long as we're in disobedience, the glory of the Lord isn't going to show up except to tell us that we're in disobedience. <laughs> then it's going to show up. <laughs> the glory of the Lord is not just a fun-filled experience joy ride down at the local Godney land. It is the appearance of a creator talking to a creation. Numbers 14.21 But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. He knew that back in Numbers? That's a prophecy, son. <laughs> I know, Dad. I know. That's a prophecy about 4,000 years ago, son. Uh, yeah. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, yep. That means it's coming still. Uh, yep. That means those people who are asking for it and waiting for it 
who haven't seen it yet, it's coming. Otherwise, he wouldn't prophesy of it. The point of prophecy is so that it, you'll have your joyful when it happens. But the point here is, it's coming in pieces. It's coming all over the place. It's increasing. But it hasn't all come yet. It has not yet filled the whole earth. All the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. You know, it's going to be a real interesting experience. All of a sudden, it's not just Mount Sinai that vanishes. It's all of Seattle that vanishes. It's all of Chicago that vanishes. Who knows? You get the right prophets, the right people in the middle of a town with the right relationship with God, and who's to say that the building on 4th and 5th of Smith and Jones, the, you know, such and such building that was borrowed or rented or, you know, the dome that was borrowed or rented for a prayer meeting isn't going to just vanish one day. <laughs> in the midst of the sight of the people. See, we're always thinking of the presence of God contained within the building. But the glory of God is contained by nothing. Want a revival? Numbers 14, 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice. The uh-oh hits real quick after this verse. Didn't I show you my glory? See, we're almost a little bit safer right now in a certain carnal line of thinking. Because we haven't seen the glory of God to the greatest quantity yet, we can walk away, come back, walk away, come back, walk away, come back sometimes. We haven't quite crossed the lines of Hebrews 6 where they turn, go back to perdition and are not able to be renewed. Because they haven't come face to face with the absolute magnitude of it yet. But we're moving that direction. Which means there's going to come a day when people who buck the Lord are going to be just plain bucking the Lord. And they're going to know what they're bucking. And they're not going to have any question of what they're bucking. And they're going to say, no, I'm going to do my witchcraft anyway. And that's the way it is. Book of Revelation. They yet not repented of these things. And the glory of the Lord will do what it's going to do. Because, because, because. A wonderful God he is. Number 1619. Korah, man who thought he knew something, gathered all the congregation against them, thought he knew something, under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. <coughs> Number 1642 says, And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Now, if you go read the rest of the story, you find out that Korah and his band never got home from that meeting. They demanded an audience with the king over their dispute with the appointee of the king, which was their right. So, uh-uh, they were in rebellion. No. Every soul has a right to appeal to a higher power. But you know what? If you're wrong, the countersuit's a pain. <laughs> Numbers 20:16. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And this was their habit, okay? Go in, close the door. This kind of sounds like a verse, doesn't it? Go into your closet, close the door. And have a little conversation with the glory, why don't you? It is the case, it is the case, that when God appoints a man, he supports a man with himself. It is also the case that when people fight an appointee of the Lord, they better have good cause. Or else, Touch, my not, touch not mine anointed becomes very real. I heard somebody say one time, well, that verse, you know, says, touch not mine anointed, don't do my prophets any harm. That doesn't really mean don't touch, don't touch the anointed and don't touch the prophets because we're all anointed. And your point is that that gives you the right then to rail on everybody? <laughs> I'm being very facetious. You see, in defense 
or an argument against people who use the verse and say, don't go touching that man, that prophet, that evangelist, that whatever. Be careful how you deal with that person. To those who believe they have the right to critique and analyze and do everything they can and scope down on them and write documents and papers and this and that and tear them down and put them up in the public, you know, and wave a flag. And they use the defense of, they overuse this verse. <laughs> I'm anointed too. Yeah, well then, you just judged yourself. You just put yourself in front of the door of the tabernacle, demanded the power, that, the, that the glory of God show up, because you believed you're equal to that man. Now what? You better have the glory of the Lord. You better be Paul going to Peter and correcting him because you're in the Lord and Peter's in the wrong. Otherwise, that which is on Peter is going to come back the other direction. The glory of the Lord is corrective. The glory of the Lord is instructive. Be careful of your self-importance when you're going in the presence of the Lord. Don't end up like Korah, sure of yourself and falling for yourself. The glory mentioned in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5.24. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he lives. Whew. Whew. Yes, when the glory of the Lord shows up, it isn't just going to appear to stand there. It's going to speak out of the fire. It's going to communicate. It is going to say, <clears throat> take off your shoes, i got some business with you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to go right on, right on, right on, shoes off, feet down, hi, what's up? Look at it this way. Men of God have had angels appear. And at the sight of an angel collapsed to the ground. This is the glory of God appearing. What, you think you're going to stand with an attitude? You will, up to the moment he opens his mouth. And his word doesn't return void, but yours will. <laughs> we acknowledge, we accept, we must say that the glory of the Lord came out of that mouth. Came out of that, the words of the Lord came out of that mouth. God talks with man and lives. This is our story. This is the argument. This is the fight with the God of this world who runs around telling all his disciples... He's not real. He doesn't care. He's not up there. He's an absentee landlord. He died. Pick whichever philosophy stream you want. The truth of the matter is, when the glory shows up, those arguments are going to become null and void. I saw him. Oh my God. He's real. Oh no. That's real. I heard him speak. That's what... The New Testament's talking about when it says a stranger walks into your congregation and all of a sudden he hears prophecy coming out of you, he hears these things being spoken, and he says, I saw. That was God. I know. There's no question in my mind. Somebody walk up and say, how do you know it was God? <laughs> I know. There's no question in my mind. The greater the glory, the, least, the lesser the questioning. In the time of the kings and the chronicles, the glory was spoken about. 1 Kings 8.11 So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Yep, from mountain to tabernacle to temple. Where do you worship him? How strong is your worship of him? When a man sets aside a place for God, God sets aside a place for man. When man draws nigh to God, God draws nigh to man. That was his choice. That was his commandment. You turn your face to me no matter how many times you stumble and draw yourself back to me and I will draw myself back to you. That's why repentance works. It doesn't work simply because you changed your mind. It's because he changed his. When you said, Lord, I'm sorry, please come closer. He said, okay, forgiven. I'll come closer. So you summon... You request, you petition, that the glory of the Lord fill the house of the Lord. Fill every church. Any church that has the name of Christ across the front door 
is candidate for the glory of God. They need to be filled. It will weed out the mixed multitude. It will weed out the unbelievers. It will weed out the Korah, the arguers. It will weed out. And a remnant will be left that serve the glory of the Lord. Second Chronicles 5.14 So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. They can't minister, they can't stand. Well, I don't know if God slays people in the spirit. They can't stand. <laughs> How do you picture it? They could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. They could not be able to function. Oh, these men are drunk. No, they're not. It's just the Holy Ghost on them. Same thing. Same thing. Tongues of fire dispersing itself upon the heads of 120 people in an upper room. These men look drunk. Nope. Yep. Point of view. Second Chronicles 7, 1 and 2 and 3. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. I imagine that, standing in the middle of a building or out in a field, and somebody stands up to pray, and out of the sky comes fire. Mm -hmm. And consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Oof. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house... They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That will be the message that will come out of anybody who's visited the Spirit of God directly. Yeah, he corrected me, but it was with such gentleness. Yeah, he instructed me, and I now know better, but he was so good about it. We do not need to fear the Lord the way the world fears a dictator. We need to fear the Lord the way that a fool fears jumping off a cliff without a parachute. There are consequences to everything. But the truth of the matter is, if you summon, and I use the word summon on purpose because he said, Call upon my name. You summon the presence of the Lord. When he shows up, whatever manifestation he shows up in, through, or with, you will be on the ground. You will be worshiping. <coughs> Your heart will be on the ground for sure. You might be like this. Immobile. Nobody can get through to you standing any more than the guy they couldn't get through laying. But inside, everything inside of you will be down, humble, kissing his feet. Mercy, 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 mercy. I think one of the reasons why they sang mercy was because they knew their sins. And you know what it says in the scripture? It says, no man hath seen God and lived. No man can go face to face with God. No Moses or... You can't see my full glory. No, I don't dare do that yet. But here's what I will do. I'll give it to you to the measure that you can cope with it. Want more? Grow. Can't put new wine in an old wineskin. Give me a new wineskin. If you have to, refashion it. Well, I just, I just, I just. Well, fine. Then give me the wineskin. Let me change it out for you for a better wineskin so you can handle more of me. And the more glory you can handle the more glory I'll give you. If you want to sing about something, let's copy the psalmists. They sang about the glory of the Lord. Psalm 63, 2. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. Now let's see. They had the experience. They saw the glory. Then they went home and sang about it. Ever had God do something for you? Go ahead, make up a song. He'll like it. Write a poem about it. He'll like it. Write a story about it. He'll like it. Because you're giving him praise. You're giving him honor. 
Can I have a witness? That person needs it. Psalm 72, 19. Blessed be His glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and amen. You know what that is? That's agreement. God prophesied through His man that He would fill the whole earth with His glory and the psalmist is agreeing with that. Where two or three agree touching anything, shouldn't it happen? Psalm 85, 9. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. I used to always think that kind of meant riches and fame and glory, you know. But what if it means glory, you know? What if it means and glory will dwell in the land? What if that which was on the mountain, that which was on the tabernacle, and that which was in the temple now is just kind of around the land and you're walking and breathing in it? Instead of saying the words, you know, in him we live and move and have our being, as a concept, it becomes in him we're moving and living and having our being. Ooh. We have no idea how far too literal this is going to be when it happens, as it happens. Psalm 102.16 When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. I'm not done building yet. When I get ready to put it together, you'll see more of me. The church, which is a forerunner of these things that have been promised to Israel, is going to get to see some of these things to a measure before the full measure of the promise that was given to Israel. So, if the church will summon and keep saying, I want more of your glory, I want more of your presence, I want more of your anointing, I want more of you, and as it were, from a historical perspective, it gets two quarts, Israel's going to get five quarts because they were promised it. And they, without us, cannot be made complete. Why are we supposed to be praying for Israel? Because God's yet to work on them. They're part of us. They're not a strange nation over there someplace. They're part of us. They think we're part of them. Right now, some of them don't think we're part of anything. <laughs> but those who do think we're part of them. Actually, they're part of us. The Jewish, Israelitish background is being grafted back in where they were <laughs> grafted out. Which means they're being grafted back into the part of the tree that we're already growing from. Because we became the middle piece. So they're going to be learning from the glory that's on the church. So that they can move closer to receiving the glory that was promised them. We are in this together. Psalm 104.31 104.31 the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. Psalm 138.5 Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. They shall sing in the ways of the Lord. Wow. Well, Psalm 148.13 Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. Hang on to that one. His glory is above earth and heavens. That means, all right, let's get a picture here. Everybody, look up at the sky and count the stars. <laughs> now, want to know how big His glory is? Bigger than that. <laughs> That's the decorations on the back of His kingly garment. Hmm. Hear what the prophet spoke. Isaiah 2.10 Enter into the rock and hide thee in the desert for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The glory of his majesty. Might I say the majesty of his glory, which is the glory of his majesty. Vast kingship. And glory is his scepter. I think I'll glory in his glory. <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. Isaiah 2.19 They shall go into the holes of the rocks, into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to sh shake terribly the earth. 
Yeah, there is a side of his majesty that is severity. And there is a side of his majesty that is goodness. That's what the New Testament says. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. And in both cases, his glory is, using both terms of definition for glory, given to him and manifested from him. Isaiah 2.21 to go to the clefts of the rocks, into the tops of the ragged rocks, for fear of the Lord, for the glory of his majesty, when he arises, shake terribly the earth. Oh boy, these guys are in trouble. Isaiah 4, 5. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies, a cloud and a smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. Got me thinking about that for a minute. If I simplify that to myself, the glory is our defense? See? For upon all the glory shall be a defense. It's in brackets in my my uh, translation. Which I'm pretty sure it's King James. My point here is what we saw on the mount of a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Could you imagine all of a sudden an entire church surrounded by fire? Amen. I've read a couple of stories. Stories, because I wasn't there. Not fiction. Accounts where fire went around a building, around a church, mm -hmm. to protect from something that was about to come at them. Mm. I've read a great number of stories of angels being around, camped around a building, yeah. where the man or woman or family of God was in. When the glory of the Lord shows up, he does come to protect, too. When the glory of the Lord showed up to Israel to lead them out of the wilderness, it was bad news for Pharaoh and his crew. It was good news for Israel. But then when Israel started having problems, the glory that shows up for Israel, which was good news, now becomes bad news. But good news overall. In the end, we will be crying out Isaiah 6.3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. But for today, only parts of the earth will be. For today, we look through a glass dimly. For today, here a little, there a little. Isaiah 28, 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Wow. Now we're going to wear the glory like a crown? Mm -hmm. And a diadem of beauty, I'm going to have a diadem of beauty. What is it that decks us out in God but God himself? Mm -hmm. What is it that gives us anything except God himself? It's not our riches or lack of riches. It's not our, our, our brilliance or lack of brilliance. It's the presence of the Lord. We will wear it as a crown. Isaiah 35, 2. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Keep coming back to see the glory of the Lord. Now the glory of the Lord, keep in mind, is not just the manifestation of the presence. It's everything that comes with the manifestation of the presence. So to see the glory of the Lord, I mean, healings, miracles, that, you name it, and visible, tangible. <coughs> Isaiah 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Shall be revealed. That means there's more to come from the time of Isaiah's statement. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. I used to always take this verse as, and I'm not going to let credit go to somebody else for something I did. My glory, that which I deserve, the praise to me. All of a sudden I'm wondering if it also doesn't have the other side of that coin. My glory, I'm not going to give to them or them or them. I'll give it to you. Because we're not another. We're the ones who are promised it. Mm -hmm. 
Isaiah 43, 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, I have made him. I've created him for my glory? Could he really mean that exactly as he says it? Created for his glory. Yes, we are created to be a praise to God, where people will praise God because of us. We do our good works, the Father will get the credit. <laughs> That's New Testament for you. But I think there's also a truth here. They were created for my glory. They're vessels for honor. They're vessels for glory. I wonder what portion of the glory I'm supposed to have. I wonder what portion of the glory you're supposed to have. I wonder what portion of the glory the whole body together is supposed to have. In us, through us, and on us, all at the same time? And then out from us? Mm. Isaiah 58, 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. <laughs> the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Isaiah 58, 8. Yep, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life if you are in the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 60, verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Neboeth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with, the, with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. I thought that was an interesting phrase. I will glorify the house of my glory. The house that I picked to put my glory on, I'm going to glorify. <laughs> I will lift up. I will exalt. I will show forth. It's a husband proudly showing off a new bride. Isaiah 60, verse 19. The sun shall no more, shall be no more thy light by day, neither by brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. That's going to pop up in the Revelation passage a little later. You'll probably recognize it. There's going to come a day where you don't even need light because the glory of the Lord is so bright that you don't need light. Take that spiritual type someplace for a little while and chew on it. Wow. That which he ordained to give us guidance is going to pass because the glory is going to be greater than that. Wow. Not every jot and tittle is going to... Not one jot and tittle is going to pass away until all be fulfilled. <laughs> and then when it's fulfilled, then what? <coughs> then it gets even brighter. <laughs> and it gets even greater. Isaiah sixty three fifteen. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and thy glory. That was his request. Look down from your habitation, from thy glory. And Isaiah sixty six eighteen says, For I know their works and their thoughts it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they Amen. shall come and Amen. see my glory. So even the nations and tongues, the ones who have been bucking against them, there will come a day when every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and one of the reasons why they will do that is because the glory of the Lord will be there. Now if we go back in our minds to the beginning of this, and we say, Israel standing with Aaron looks across the wilderness and sees the glory of the Lord... How do you get nations and tongues to come near the glory of the Lord except have a manifestation of the glory that's so great that the whole earth sees it? What is it going to be like after the return of Christ when he comes to set up his throne and the glory of the Lord lands, as it were, on all of Israel? Today in the news, I mean... I just think to myself, what will that broadcast look like? Will they be able to do a global broadcast is always a question. But if they could, what would they say? What kind of rumors would travel and how fast? Did you see that? Did you see that? Do you realize that Israel's completely consumed like the mountain was? And all the kings will bow. They're not going to sit there and go, I didn't believe in you and I don't believe in you now. Right. <laughs> 
They're going to see that glory and go, and, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Hang with me. Hang with me. Ezekiel 128. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. That's pretty. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Ooh, now it's colorful! <laughs> you know, before I was kind of envisioning this bright white cloud, bright shiny lightning fire thing, you know, and, and you know, on the mountain and stuff, and kind of looks... And now all of a sudden it's rainbow colored. Now that's not fair. Now it's going to shimmer and it's going to shine and it's going to... Is it possible that the manifestation of God's glory is actually going to increase in beauty? Sure. Why not? Ezekiel's understanding, Ezekiel's temple is all about the future, where some of these other prophets and Moses were all talking about up to the future. <laughs> we have no idea. I'll say it again, no idea. When the glory of the Lord shows up, it may show up like a rainbow. That would be just great. You know, as you I, wouldn't that be great? You walk up to the church, you go to knock on the door, and the door looks kind of rainbow. You scratch your head, and you reach through the handle anyway, and you open the door and go through the rainbow. <laughs> and you look around, and you go, seems normal enough. You look back, and the rainbow's still on the door. Think about that. Think about Moses walking through the tent of the tabernacle and he walks up to the tabernacle and he passes right through the cloud. <coughs> he closes the door and people saw him go in. Whoosh. Door closes. Whoosh. Then what? Wait. When you step into the presence of God, what's it going to be like? He's trying to give us some clues. Ezekiel 3.12 Then the Spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of great rushing saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. Ezekiel 3.12 Ezekiel 3.23 Then I rose, went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, as the glory which I saw by the river of Kivar, and I fell on my face. Multiple manifestations. Oh, I recognize that one. <laughs> you know, you should. I showed up five days ago. You know what I'm saying? If somebody calls you on the phone regularly, you recognize their voice, don't you? So they oftentimes do not have to say, Hi, this is Anthony. I just go, Hi. You know, the other day somebody called me up at my home and they started to talk. They went about a sentence and I wasn't sure who it was. Because I just wasn't registering. And I said, Say another sentence. <laughs> and the person spoke the second sentence and I said, Ah, now I know who you are. <laughs> so, you want to discern the Spirit of the Lord? Tell it to keep talking. Want to know if it's a demon attack you? Let it talk a little bit. It'll betray itself. Want to know if it's your flesh talking? Let it talk just for an extra two seconds or three seconds. Want to know if you're being pushed by demonic forces from behind? You let it go for more than a minute, you'll find out. You know what I'm saying? Would be better if we could catch the phone call right away and say, whoops, that's a demon hanging up. Much better if we pick up the phone and go, wow, that's his presence of the Lord. I'm ready. But sometimes it takes human beings a little bit of, i got to adjust me perceptors time. Call her ID. <laughs> yeah, call her ID. There you go. He recognized. He said, ah, that's the same one I saw over there by the river. <clears throat> Men of God, when you, when you study them, you'll find that over and over they start getting more and more familiar. The older they get, the more familiar they are. They don't, they don't go from question to question. They usually go from uh-oh to uh-oh. <laughs> Ezekiel 8.4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Now the glory in real life is matching a vision of the glory. Think about that. That means if God puts you in a vision and shows you something about your future or shows you something about heaven, it's a foretaste of things to come. That'd be great. Got a piece of heaven in your heart? Wait till you see it when it's in real life. Ezekiel 9.3 The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, wherein he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writers in corn by his side. 
So the glory of the Lord of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Now we got an angel showing up and it's got glory on it. Sounds like a calling card, don't you think? See, the devil can disguise himself and his horde as angels of light, but they cannot disguise themselves as angels of glory. That's true. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. oh. Ezekiel 10.18 Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims, it moves. Uh, what happens if the glory of the Lord shows up in the living room and then moves to the f next floor? Uh, follow it. Whither it goeth, thou goeth. When the glory of the Lord showed up with Israel, they packed up their tents and went for a trip. Yeah. When it stopped, they unpacked their bags. Mm -hmm. Do that same thing in your spiritual walk and you'll be just fine. Ezekiel 10.19 says, The cherubims lifted up their wings, mounted up from the earth, in my sight, when they went up, the wheels also were beside him, and everyone stood at the door of the east of the gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. Cherubim moving, and an encompassing glory. <laughs> I can't even begin to conceive what that must have felt like. Ezekiel 11.22 then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory, glory of God of Israel was over above them. Ezekiel 11.23 The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. Moved again. All I'm trying to get you to see on this is, if it moves, something new is happening. <laughs> now a revival is taking place in Chicago. Five years later, it's dead. But it's in Palm Springs. Five years later, it's in Florida. Five years later, it's in Germany. Five years later, it's in... Get my drift? <coughs> Has God changed his mind? Was he... Like, did he fail in Chicago? No. Now I'm working here. Now I'm working there. Now I'm working here. Now I'm working there. You know what I'm saying? Should not surprise us. So the prayer is, O oh Lord, come here. Come here. Ezekiel 43.2 Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Who? Look out, incoming! <laughs> At a distance. Oh, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Quick, get your coat on! Run! It's going to rain! That was one man's response. Now, how about the cry goes, Look, I see something about the size of a man's hand, and it's really bright. And it's moving my way. Run into that one. <laughs> Ezekiel 43, 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is towards the east. Ezekiel 43, 5. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Uh, if you're going to make a major doctrine, make sure that there's plenty of verses to support it. Are you happy? <laughs> Ezekiel 44, 4. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. I would say Ezekiel had a pretty good relationship with God. Let's see, Moses, we had lots of verses with Moses having it, a few verses with some other people having it, and then a whole lot of verses with Ezekiel having it. Seems to be a point here. Major prophets? Habakkuk. Good old Habakkuk. What's a Habakkuk? He's the guy who knew the glory of the Lord. 2.14 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can you run from the ocean? Can you hide from it? Can you say it's not there? So, what was prophesied in Numbers, repeated later on by the kings, is repeated later on by Habakkuk and Ezekiel. Habakkuk 3.3, 3, God came from Teman, 
the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Just what did this guy see? <laughs> Can you imagine it? Well, I guess we'll have to. Because when Christ rules the earth, you think there isn't going to be the glory of the Lord all over the earth and praise going up 24-7? Zechariah 2.5 for I, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Mm. Not long distance glory, up short and personal glory. And a wall of fire. So, if the glory is with us, are we safe? If the glory is with us, are we safe? Sure we are. We're protected from outside. We're not safe from him. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Because we're going to still be being integrated. Better be distilled water. Zechariah 6.13 even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Look forward to the future. Look forward to the future. How am I doing on time? I want to finish this message. Will you bear with me? Mm-hmm. Okay. New Testament. Old is done away, doesn't apply anymore. Right. right. Matthew 6.13 Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. I used to think the credit. I used to take that word almost like the credit. I'm beginning to think maybe he meant what he said. And thine is the glory. Yeah, you get the credit, but you're the only one who's the source of glory. Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me, that's us, raise your hand, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, <laughs> you shall also sit upon twelve thrones judging twelve tribes of Israel. That's what he promised his, his uh, twelve <coughs> apostles. You're going to get to sit on the throne of my glory. On separate thrones. Now then you take that verse and you embed it, or link it, hyperlink it if you like, to the one that Paul said, I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. You're on a throne. If you're seated in heavenly places with Christ, what kind of throne is it? It's a throne of glory. Matthew 24:30 Then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory mm -hmm. How we get an adjective added to this mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw that and just about jumped out of my chair. I thought, of course. <laughs> you see, go back again in our minds. The glory of the Lord on a mountain. The glory of the Lord on a tabernacle. The glory of the Lord in a temple. The glory <coughs> of the Lord across the wilderness. The glory of the Lord in the heavens above the heavens over the cherubim. Mm -hmm. The glory of the Lord in a sun. Amen. My goodness. <coughs> Something that can actually be the vessel of the tabernacling of the glory of, of the, Lord. the Lord and you're in him yes. think about that back to the beginning of the message my glory will be upon thee whoops okay upon thee but stop right here look at Christ he's going to return with great power it says he's going to take the nations and split them apart he's going to smash yep. like pot shirts. he's going to yep. do all this stuff that's his power what's mm -hmm. his glory What's his glory? What's his glory? Come on. It's going to be like something so far beyond any Christian ever dreamt of. We're going to think heaven came to earth. Matthew 
Matthew 25:31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. There's glory there, there's glory there, there's glory here. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Right now, it all looks very natural. Well, I heard somebody on the radio the other day talking <coughs> about the, this movie, The Passion, that's come out. And he started out by saying, I don't know what the big deal is. We're talking about a mythological man 2,000 years ago, which we don't even know if half the history is even true, what was said about him. And, I mean, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, mythological. What an interesting throw. Can you imagine the glory of the Lord and a man standing up and going, you're myth. <laughs> I don't think so. See, because he's never met the glory, he doesn't know it's not a myth. When you meet the glory, you don't go, it's a myth. You go, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So, everybody who listened to that broadcast should be praying, this guy learn, it's not a myth. My point is, when Christ rules and the whole world is now, remember, the whole world is the leftovers. They're the dregs of the earth. Now remember, when Christ returns, it's a mess. It's not a nice place. It's a lot of really bad people left over who are going to have to face off with the reality of something they fought most of their life. <coughs> they did. Their false religions fought it from the nations. And their anti-Christ attitudes, which is what brought in world government, fought him. They're going to survive it. These are survivors of the devastation of the wrath of God. That means that's the dregs of the grapes of the wrath of God. That means it's the grape skins and the seeds and the hard stuff that wouldn't break under the stomping of the wrath of God. And then they're going to have to face him, whom they curse, spit at, disregarded, disallowed, dis, this, this, this. So, yeah, he's coming with great power, but that glory is what's going to get him. Luke 2.19 And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. That's at the beginning. That's when Christ is being born. Having just newly, newly been. And the glory is already there waiting. Ooh. Luke 9.26 Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's what and of the holy angels what well let's put it together all right let's let's put this and summarize it you know those angels that showed up to ezekiel they showed up with glory you know that mountain that burned on fire that was the father showing up mhm all dispensations of god's glory mhm and the son shows up with his dispensation of God's glory. Now I'm going to throw one in for fun. Jude. And we will return myriads upon myriads, coming back to execute judgment upon... That means there's a glory of the saints, too. The glory is something that gets to abide. Luke 9.31 Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Pretty sure that's the Mount of Transfiguration they're talking about. And out of the light, the voice spoke, and Moses and Elijah were standing there, out of the glory. Luke 9.32 But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they awoke, they saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. Mm -hmm, I thought so. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Nice, natural people taking a nice, natural nap wake up to, oh my God. <laughs> What was the, do you remember what their response was to that? It is a good thing to abide here. That was their response. Should we build a tent? Should we tabernacle? Right now, right here. Let's stay. Absolutely right. He said, later. Later. Luke twenty one twenty seven. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Yeah, we got the point, okay? John 2.11 This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. 
That's at the beginning of his ministry. See, I could have taken the time to order all this for us, so we saw it in a pattern. But you get the point. At the beginning of the ministry, the end of the ministry, the millennium, the start of the millennium, the end of this, the beginning of that, the second coming, the beginning of time to the end of time, the glory of the Lord is a constant. You might as well write it in one of them physics equations. It's a constant. Immutable, unchangeable, will always happen. The issue is, how much do you want Amen. to see it? That's right. John says in John 11:40, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? This is Jesus speaking, but it's in John. Didn't I say you'd see the glory of God? <laughs> I told you you'd see it. John 12, 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. He references back. That means he accepted what the book said. He acknowledged that it happened. You know, this is that. This is that, guys. You know that prophecy in Joel? This is that. You know, guys, this glory you're seeing here? This is that. You know, Ezekiel, that glory you saw last week by the river? This is that. Hear me. This is that. Mm -hmm. Means it's going to happen again. Did we ever see something in a revival in the past? It will happen again. It has to. Because God's not going to go giving his glory to something else. Visions, dreams, you name it. This is that. It might appear slightly different. It might appear slightly the same. It might increase in magnitude. Good God, we couldn't handle the last set of magnitudes. The future is brighter. And isn't the glory of the latter house supposed to be greater than the glory of the former house? I used to always think that meant, you know, the, the honor and the glory, you know. No, it probably means what it says. The glory that was there is going to be greater over here. Isn't this is that? Greater work shall ye do than I do because I go to my Father? This is that. How do I know Jesus lived and healed people? Because if I pray for somebody and they get healed and I did it in his name, then I know that this is that. There's no difference between glory. John 17, 22. The glory which thou givest me I have given them. <laughs> Thought so. That they may be one even as we are one. Uh-oh. He's given us a measure of that so that we'll become one. Mm -hmm. What breaks down doctrinal walls faster than the presence of God showing up in the same room with two people with opposite beliefs and all of a sudden one brother looks at the other brother and goes, well, I guess we're both in him. <laughs> I was a little doubtful about you. <laughs> Acts 7-2 uh, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. I mean, listen up. The God of glory. I could stop right there. Now he's describing it as an attribute, not a manifestation. The God of glory, you know, that God. There's the God of stick. There's the God of wood. There's the God of rock. There's the God of this world. You get my drift here? And there's the God of glory. <laughs> Who would you rather worship? I'll choose the God of glory, thank you. Appeared unto Abraham our father. That was the God of glory. Acts 7.55 But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, while well, people came to kill him, and saw the glory of God. Oh. You know, all that persecution we're all worried about? If you're in the glory, it's going to be like, oh. Nothing. And Jesus standing on the right side of God. Ooh. The glory of God and Jesus standing on the right side. Now, I've, I've had a few little debates with people over time about what this really meant, what really happened here. I'm joking a little bit. What really happened here? I mean, what did really happen? It was just a vision, right? Just a picture, just a scene. doesn't really describe anything. But it says the glory of God. Why did he make that distinction? The glory of God and Jesus standing on the other side. Because the Old Testament manifestation and the New Testament manifestation are of the same God's 
story. He was, in essence, saying to them when he was being attacked and assaulted and about to be murdered, you don't get it. Everything you've been trusting in of the glory of God from all those Old Testament verses I just read you, the Son is standing right next to it in the same glory. Now, what do you do with that, reprobate Israelites? What do you do with that, unbeliever? See? Revelation of God had to be updated for them, brought more current to what God was now doing. They had accepted Moses. They could accept the glory on the mountain. They could accept the glory in the temple. They could accept the glory in the temple. They can even accept the glory of God in heaven. But to say that the sun is standing next to that glory? Blasphemy. Abject blasphemy from their point of view. But nevertheless true. We will see Jesus. We will see the God of glory. And they will be right next to each other. And when it says, and we will come make our abode with him, it finally gets me. The glory of God and his son will make their abode with me. Mm. Ooh, that's mm. nice. Acts 22.11. You, you can supply the guess who said this. When I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them which were with me, I came unto Damascus. <laughs> yep, like I said, glory of God, corrective action. Paul says to the Romans, 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now you have a whole new appreciation for what we're short of. <laughs> what is the glory of God? Paul says to the Corinthians, which not, and this is in Corinthians 2.8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. glory. Unbelievable statement when you put it in this light. Woo. Talk about cut your nose off to spite your face. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, talking about Moses' stones, obviously, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was done away, and that's the beginning of an argument. If they couldn't handle looking at Moses when he came back off of that mountain that had the glory on it, because the glow came with him, and he had to put a veil over his face because they couldn't handle it, and the tablets were so bright they could barely look at it, and it was just too much. How much more so is the glory that's coming then going to be awesome when we see it? We're going to have no trouble at all accepting that, yes, this is what God wants. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. I used to always think of that as kind of like, a, you know, pardon the pun, an evolutionary process. You know, going from glory to glory. A little better, a little better, a little bit stronger, a little more muscular, a little bit... You know, what do you think of when you say from glory to glory? Well, from a better, you know, one set of experiences of God to a little bit better experiences of God. What if it's really going from the glory of God to the glory of God to the glory of God to the glory of God, and it's truly going from glory to glory to glory? Cool. I'll have to meditate on them. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. There's your, here's their addendum. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It means he's going to move us through that. See why I didn't want to stop the sermon. I've got to get to the New Testament verses. Second Corinthians four six. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Remember that Old Testament passage: light shining out of darkness in the face of Jesus Christ. So what? Look him in the face.
Ephesians 1.17 The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, <laughs> may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Father of glory. Ephesians 3.16 That He would grant you according to the riches of His glory. Oh, now that took on a new meaning. That took on an amplified meaning. You know, I used to think of it almost like the riches of the abundance of His supply. How about the riches of His glory? Is there anything that came out of that glory that wasn't glorious? I think that we are in for a shock of what we're asking for. People who asked to have more of the Holy Ghost did not expect to get filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And if we ask for the glory of God, we are not going to realize what we're going to get. But we've got to ask for it. We have to ask for it. Ephesians 3.16 That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by might, by his spirit, in the inner man. According to the riches of his glory. Paul says to the Philippians in 4.19 My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. By Christ Jesus. That's the door. That's the way. That's how you're going to get the glory. No man comes up to the Father except through the Son. That's where the glory is. Right on the other side of the door in the face of Jesus. Paul says to the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2.12 that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom. That's where most Christians stop. And glory. That's where we got to go. We're not just trying to get in the kingdom. We're not trying to get just get saved. We're trying to get to the glory that we fell short of. Second Thessalonians 1 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Don't want to be in the front of that verse. Don't want to be in the way of that when it happens. Second Thessalonians two fourteen. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. He called you by our gospel. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of promise is that? A huge one. A virtually unattainable one. A milk it for all it's worth one. You'll get as much as you can get one. Dig in. Paul advises Timothy in Timothy 2.10, 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Hebrews 1.3, speaking of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, etc., etc., etc. Tell me where the glory of God is now. It's on the face of Jesus. It's in Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's through the body of Christ. That's where it's going to come out of, of every pore. Hebrews 3.3 3. This man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. <laughs> I don't know that that word glory should be taken the way we've been using it, but it sure does hit me. More glory than Moses. If we're accounted more, Christ was accounted more glory than Moses, and we're going to do greater works than him, then we're accounted more glory than Moses? Not only more uh, manifestation of goodness, but also more manifestation of the glory. Do you want the glory? Do you need the glory? Ever thought about asking for the glory? You're going to get more of it than Moses had. Hebrews 9.5 Over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, as he's talking about the things of the past. Peter says this, 1 Peter 1.11, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did testify, he's talking about the Old Testament prophets, when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ, we call those messianic prophecies, and the glory that should follow. Oh, he ascended. That's cool. No, you don't get it. The glory that's coming because of that 
which they wanted to know about. They saw it coming. When did they see it? Oh, in visions by the river Kibar, in places up on mountains, seeing things that they just couldn't even equate to that blew their, <coughs> their minds of things yet to come of the glory of God and what it was going to be like. They wanted to know about those things and where the ones are going to get to partake of this. This is phenomenal. 1 Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. More glory coming. 1 Peter 4.14 If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 5.4 when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. 1 Peter 5.10 But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen you, settle you. Endure what you're going through now because the glory is coming. 2 Peter 1.3 According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Christians like the and virtue part. Forget all about the and glory part. Jude 124. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. Yes. <laughs> And last but not least, of course, is good old John in the book of Revelation 5.12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, excuse me, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. He's worthy of it. Revelation 5.18, Temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Sound familiar? And from his power. Yep, they're two different things. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. <laughs> Revelation 18.1. So what I'm trying to say here is even in heaven it's still there. Wow. Revelation 18.1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. There's a glory of angels and there's a glory of God. Revelation 21.11. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone. Clear as crystal. Who are we talking about? The great city. The bride. Having the glory of God. Isn't that great? Revelation 21, 23 and 24. Last verse. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Of what? The glory. the glory. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Well, I would say then, number one, pray for the glory of God to come. Number two, yield when the glory of God comes. <laughs> number three, expect that good and bad will happen when the glory of God comes. Number four, do not be afraid of the glory of God. It will change you, but you need not fear it. And number five, seek, pursue, chase after the glory of God to be in your life. Chase after it to be in the church. Chase after it to be upon anybody and anything, anywhere that you know needs it. Because God has not yet fulfilled his promise given in Numbers, given in the Psalms, given to the, the prophets, and even given through his Son that says, I'm going to fill the whole earth with my glory. And the precursor to that is in the book of Acts chapter 2 where he says, And I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Does all mean all to you? It does to me. When God says, I will have all the earth this way, it will be all the earth this way. But it starts here a little, there a little. We're still seeing it here a little, there a little. It's still happening in small pockets and places. 
but it's happening. He is moving. Amen. We call him moving only because we see him there than over there. <laughs> but really it's us who are moving. So, let his presence completely work you over on this matter. And please pray for the glory of God. Be here. Be in you. Be in us. Thank you, yeah. Jesus, for this word, strong yeah. and healthy. We ask, Lord, that you take this word and, 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 as it were, engrave it on the tablets of our heart until such time, Lord, as we see your glory fill the whole earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.